Now, is our speaker here yet, Nate? So, I was talking to a, a couple of kids with my friends and my son the other day, and I said, you know, Pat Benatar uh, turned 59 a while back, and one of them said, who's, who's she, or who's he? And I said, well, you know, Alice Cooper's coming up for the birthday, and he said, uh, who's she? So it made me realize how really old I am, because Pat Benatar is nine days younger than me. Well... Okay, I guess I'll have to do it myself. Yeah. Yeah, is that all right, Galen? Let's bring to the meeting. <laughs> Just bring them here and we'll get them over there. Hey, Larry, where you at? Larry Honeycutt. Those of you who are not here, this, this, is a, this is what a saint looks like. He started a program to get coats for kids. And we had 127 coats donated last month, and, and tonight we got some more. So we're donating coats all through the winter to try to... He puts them on the back of the kids, and it's just amazing. If you've got a few minutes at the break, talk to Larry. It's, it's really amazing. Okay, so the presentation tonight is not technical because I'm as dumb as a rock. But, you know, I, I do have some experiences that people have told me that are kind of amazing. Uh, and I also want to let everybody know kind of how this group came to be. And it came through a lot of convolutions, so bear with me. And I told the chef, no eggs or tomatoes out tonight, just to be sure. All right, it is, the title of this is not the destination, it's the journey. And I've always loved that because in, in the process of going through my life, and I look back on it, it's not accomplishments that are important. It was the road that I traveled, the people that I met, and the things that happened along the way that really has defined who I am. And I think it defines all of us. This is me. I was always a rebel. It's not actually, but I wish it was. Okay, where did I get this really, really strong desire I have to help kids? I didn't always have it. You know, um, when I lived in Roanoke, Virginia, way back in the 80s, yes, I'm very old, uh, I had an opportunity to be inspired by a guy in our office uh, that was a big brother. And he told me about his experience with this, this little boy that, uh, that he had been a big brother to. The big brother program is, and the big sister program as well, it's for kids that don't have a parent. They've passed away, they've gone, they've disappeared, whatever. They don't have a parent. They might have one parent, but they're missing the other one. And they're missing a big chunk of their life. And in this day and time, we see a lot of that. So I had a chance to, to get paired up with a six-year-old boy in Roanoke. And his father was dead, and his mother was desperate. I mean, she had, a, she had a really difficult time herself, a lot of health issues. And so his name was Claude. And when you commit to it, you commit to a year. And that's a good thing because you can start losing your nerve pretty quick when you get into this. But every, all I did was, you know, two weekends a month, I would go get Claude and we'd go hang out together. We'd go to a movie or we'd go, you know, we'd go have some lunch. We'd go hang out in the park. You know, we just kind of hang out together. And uh, I can tell you without going into great detail, it was one of the most powerful, nerve-wracking, heart-rending, and fulfilling experiences I ever had in my life. It completely changed me. It changed the way I look at people. It changed the way I look at children. It really helped to begin to build in me a strong desire to give myself away to somebody else and to reap that wonderful, wonderful benefit that comes back from it. And if you've never done it, do it. If you have done it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's, it's so important to start there and do that. So look into the big brothers and the big sisters. Now, I started a company uh, back in 1985. Yes, I am old. Uh, and I was, I was just doing a little bit of consulting work in the food service industry, of all things, uh, working out of my house. I didn't have anything, but I was just trying to build me a little business. 
doing this and that, a little bit, a couple of computers I'd work on, and you know things like that. Back in '85, they didn't do very well, uh, so you know I did a little bit of whatever I could. So I'm standing in front of him. Who, who knows what that is behind me? Yeah, that's the Louvre in Paris. Uh, I have I have done business in, not visited. I've done business in 32 countries, and I can tell you that Paris is a great place to be. I really like Paris. Uh, not every place is. Uh, so I started this company, and this fellow that I knew, he got fired from his job. I wasn't fired from the job, but he had a lot of good ideas, and so he said, can I work with you? Uh, I didn't really have anything. I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. So I said, okay, you can come work with me. So we got together, and we got us a little office, one of them key mount offices over South Park, and we set up and said, okay, what are we going to do? Well, I had some contacts in the government that I'd worked in the government for many years, and so I called them up and I said, you know, I can get some training on management and communication, and I can teach anybody. And I, to my great surprise, they said, okay. And they, they sent me out to Nebraska, of all places. Anybody ever been to Shadron, Nebraska? Well, if you drive out in the middle of the desert, a million miles away from everything, that is more populated than Shadron. It was amazing. We got out there, and we gave some training to some of these government people. And uh, one thing led to another, and we ended up with more contracts and more contracts and started doing some more things. And how many know, how many have been to Villa Antonio's on South Boulevard? Well, Villa's been here for a long time, and I've known Tony for a long time because that was one of the first consulting jobs I had. And I don't think Tony would mind me telling this story. I didn't know Tony. Tony's actually Spanish. <laughs> he's not Italian. But he carries it off extremely well. He's from Barcelona. Uh, but he has a very, very bad temper. Or he used to. He's, he's just a teddy bear now. But when, my, first, my first job over there consulting, I was supposed to go over there and help get his book straight. It was a mess. And so when I pulled up in the parking lot on a Saturday morning, I saw this fellow leaning against the side of the building smoking a cigarette. He was the maitre d' who became a good friend even to this day. And as I approached the door, the door burst open, and a waiter come flying out with an with a apron on, and another guy came right out behind him with a cleaver screaming and chased him down to the parking lot. And I watched him go out of sight with it, and this fellow at the door, he just, he never reacted at all. And I came up, and we watched him go out of sight, and I said, uh, I'm looking for Tony. He said, I said, which one, the one in front or back? He said, the one in the back. Okay, that's my new employer. So that's how I started working for Tony. But it, it went up from there. So it, it turned out to be a pretty good job. Uh, and today, Tony and I are still great, great friends, although he still charges me full price for my meals. Anyway, we were doing food service kind of consulting and helping people this and that. And we'd, we'd worked in franchising. And so we understood franchising very well. And one day, we had this, this guy come in to our office, a little diminutive fellow named Muhammad. This was before uh, people were getting blown up all over the place. And he came in and he said, uh, I wonder if you could help me. I said, well, what do you need help with? He said, well, I have a client that has been trying to get a McDonald's franchise for a long time. And they have uh, never been contacted by McDonald's, even though they've submitted many applications. I said, well, where are they? He said, the Arab Emirates. I said, I didn't even know where the Emirates was. I said, where's that? He said, it's over next to Saudi Arabia. I knew where that was. Holy cow. Well, no wonder. Oh, you've got to help me. You know, they really want to uh, get a McDonald's franchise. Well, to do that, you have to build prospectus. You have to know traffic patterns. You have to know supply. You have to make sure that they, they, can, they can sustain a McDonald's franchise. You know, there's a lot of things that go into that. He said, will you help? I said, you know, I, I can write down what your requirements are. No, 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 we need you to help more than that. I said, I don't know what else you can have me do. He said, I'll get back to you. The next day, he brought me two first-class tickets for me and my partner to go to the United Arab Emirates. That day. Hmm. <laughs> he says, you, you will come now, please. 
I was looking around for a gun or something. No, you will come now, please. Well, I threw some stuff in the bag, my partner did too, and we ran to the airport and took off to the Arab Emirates of all places. And we got over there. It was a strange place. I mean, I, I'm just no country boy from Virginia. I've never seen anything like this. And we're looking around there, and we sat down. He's got an Egyptian business partner. It's pretty sharp. So we started asking him about things and this and that. And it turns out this guy is like a billionaire. Uh, you know, he's like a brother to the Emir or somebody, or a brother to somebody. Anyway, he's got more money than you can imagine. His own personal budget for himself, not his family, is one and a half million a month. That's what he spends on himself. So, but you know, he doesn't speak a word of English. He raises camels. But his business partner runs the business, and they build skyscrapers. <laughs> All of those buildings you see over in the Emirates now, those big, beautiful things. They're all built by the guy I used to work with. So one thing led to another, and we, went, we did a prospectus study, and we looked at all the traffic patterns, and the guy sure had enough deep pockets to handle it, and there was enough traffic there to do it. So we, we fixed up the application, the prospectus, the business plan, and we sent it to McDonald's. And McDonald's came back a week later and said, come up to Chicago. So they wanted to see our client. Well, I'm kind of wondering about this because this guy's wearing a bed sheet and he doesn't speak a word of English. And I'm going to take him to Chicago. Mm. Okay, you got to bring your business manager. <laughs> you know, I'm not just taking you. So he and the business manager fly the Concorde. You remember the Concorde? They flew the Concorde first class. That's $10,000 a ticket at that time. Yeah, the money was nothing to him. So we took him to Chicago. And we went in there, and it went pretty well. You know, the guy didn't go crazy. I mean, you know, he, he didn't say very much because he didn't understand the word we were talking about. But the business manager handled things well. And, of course, we had, we had briefed him on how to, how to behave and handle and so forth. Because, believe it or not, I used to work big time in, in fast food franchising. So I, I used to do a lot of that. And so it went real well. So that night we went to dinner at the... Uh, uh, the John Hancock building. Everybody, anybody from Chicago? You know the John Hancock building? It's way up in the air. I mean, it's way up in the air. And the bottom part of it is, is, a, is a, uh, a mall, and then the elevators go straight up and down. And to go up to the 99th edition, I think it's called, uh, the restaurant up there, it goes straight up and it's straight down. I mean, there's no stopping in between. So we're up there, and, and in the Middle East, at least at that time, they didn't use credit cards, they pay cash. And the tip is always included, or you don't give one at all, in the meal. Well, we spent about 1,800 bucks between the five or six of us that was there. And the business manager, he plunks down the cash. And I don't look at the bill, I mean, he's taking care of it. So we went to the elevator. Well, we're standing at the elevator, and this, this, uh, this uh, shake, he has a tendency to just kind of take off. You know, he just, when the door opens, he just goes. Well, the elevator door opens. These are express elevators. The elevator door opens. He steps in about the time the waiter is running toward us. We didn't leave a tip. <laughs> 1800 bucks? Uh, this don't work. So he's running to us. We turn around to see him. The elevator door closes and the Arab's gone. <laughs> now, we're in the middle of Chicago, 10 o'clock at night. And this guy's wearing a bed sheet, and he's heading out on the street. And he's got about 10 grand cash in his pocket. This is not a good thing. I can see my company just floating away on those, on those, on this road. So I tell my partner, you deal with this, I'll go after the client. So the other elevator door opened, I jumped on it and went down. I got down to the bottom, there's two security guards there looking a little bit stunned. I said, did you see an Arab come through there? So they both went this way. So I went out there, and he's already half a block down. And the things are flowing out behind him. <laughs> so I take off running after him. And I see these two guys step out from an alley behind him. Oh, he's a mark. And luckily, on the way before I catch him, I see a cop over on the other side. I say, need help? <laughs> and he takes off after me. And so we both arrive, all of us, the two guys and me and the cop, all arrive at the same time. The two guys just kind of shuffle around a little bit when they see the cop and they go on off, and I take the Arab back. That was a close one. I don't want to get that close anymore. So end of the story, we ended up getting him a franchise for the whole country. But McDonald's says, 
He can only have the franchise. We had to go through Paris to get that. That's why I like Paris. Uh, you can only have the franchise if this company, my company, handles it for the next two years. That was a nice contract, and that launched, that launched a company. So that launched my company. And we went from that to handling 22 product lines and franchises, including Pizza Hut, uh, Wendy's, McDonald's, of course, uh, Bionair Systems, uh, Great Dane Truck Trailers. Now, the way I got Great Dane Truck Trailers was I was over in Emirates, and I saw all these flatbed trailers, fields full of them, all made in Germany. And I thought, well, this ain't right. You know, we make more, we make more flatbed trailers in the United States than anybody in the world. And Great Dane was the biggest producer at that time, and they're down in Alabama. Uh, yeah. And so I called them up. I used to make a lot of calls. And this was before the Internet. The Internet was just something you thought about. So I called them up, and I said, uh, Look here, how many uh, trailers do you sell in the Middle East? Well, they hung up. Yeah. I called back. I'm serious. I want to know how many trailers you're selling in the Middle East. Are you crazy? I said, no, I'm not crazy. I'm interested. Hold on. So they put this guy on. And I said, who are you? He said, I'm John. I said, hello, John. I'm Dave. I want to know how many trailers you sell in the Middle East. Why in the heck do you want to know that? I said, because I do business over there, and I can sell your trailers. He said, you, you must have a screw loose. I said, no, I don't have a screw loose. I can make money for you if you will let me ch give me a chance. He said, well, we used to do that. I said, why'd you stop? He said, they throw me in jail. I said, well... <laughs> Why did they throw you in jail? Hell if I know. Excuse me. I just ended up in jail, and then they sent me home. I said, well, you must have offended somebody. He said, well, they offended me. I said, well, look here. you got nothing to lose if you let me handle this truck service. You don't have to pay me nothing. Just give me the exclusive right, and I'll sell it. You need to come down here and talk to Kit. Who's Kit? He owns a company. Ooh, like that. Can you be down here tomorrow? I said, I'll be down there this evening. <laughs> no, come down here tomorrow. Okay. So I got in the car the next morning, and I was down there sitting in the, in the waiting room. It's a great day. At 9 o'clock, I got up real early. And so at 9 o'clock, you know, I'm kidding, waiting. Come about noon, sat there three hours. This fellow come out and said, Are you that crazy SOB from Carolina that says he's going to sell truck trailers in dang Africa? And I said, Yep. He said, I'm Kit. Let's go over to the club. Get something to eat? Yep, yep. Okay, I'll go. So we went over. In the story, he gave me the entire African continent for all Great Dane products. So there for the longest time, we'd get these checks in the mail for $9,000, and they come from Great Dane, and we hadn't done nothing. Every time a trailer sold, we made $9,000. That's a good piece of business. I like that. I like that. So we kept on building this thing up and building it up, and it was getting really good. And we were kind of big for our britches. We think we were, we were real special. We're going to New York, and we're having meetings, and we're going to Montreal, and we're going over to Paris and London. We're doing all this stuff, spending a lot of time, spend a month. Yeah, spend a month in Egypt sometime. If you want to appreciate the United States, go well, spend a month in Egypt. Spend a month in Cairo. I guarantee you'll get back here, and you won't be stop hugging the ground for the first week. But we did pretty well. Pretty proud of myself. Walking around like I was somebody. I wasn't. And then this one deal we tried to do. Oh, we just thought we were going to win the world with this and we are going to make about $30 million off this deal. And it didn't go too well. Wiped us out. Completely. Lost everything. Bankrupt. In three months, I had nothing but what I'm wearing. I didn't even have a shirt this good. Thank goodness for Microsoft. They gave me all my shirts now. But I didn't have nothing. If it wasn't for the, uh, the goodness of a lady that let me stay in one of her rental houses, I'd have been li living on the street, quite literally. That's how far I brought. So whenever you think you're walking up there and you're so proud and you're so important, uh-uh, you're not. Better be thankful every day. So... What am I going to do? I got to eat. I got kids I got to support. I got to do something. So I got a job driving limousines. For Rose Limousine, H.A. Thompson, fine fellow. 
His boys run it now. But it was a fledgling kind of company then. H.A.'s a good old boy. He gave me a job. What do you want me to do? She drive a limousine. Okay. So I drove limousines for all kinds of people. Got some weird stories I can tell that. But then every once in a while we get these these jobs where you got the big names come in. Ooh. He said, I got somebody I want you to drive down in down in uh, Columbia. Who is it? I'm gonna tell you. Just go to our airport. Okay. So I went to our airport. They got for the celebrities, they got a little extra airport over here. They got one in Charlotte here, Signature or something. And you go over here, and then private jets come in over there. Well, this Gulfstream 5, which is a very expensive airplane, it come rolling up, and the thing opened up, and Paul and Linda McCartney come bouncing down the... Yeah, and jumped in the back of my limo. Holy cow! So I took them over to the, uh, to the, the football stadium, because that's where they were going to perform the next day. And I was hanging out over there. You know, I dropped them off, and I got to be available whenever they're, they want to go somewhere, so I got to hang close. So Paul and Linda always travel with their own chef and their own food. And uh, they wouldn't eat nothing else but what they brought. And it was all veggie stuff. So I had a veggie burger. It wasn't too terrible. But I was sitting there by myself in these picnic tables out uh, back, in a backstage kind of place. And... Uh, Somebody said, uh, can we join you? I looked around, it was Paul and Linda. I said, hey, sure, sure. So he sat down, and for the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we sat and talked. Wanted to know all about me. He was fascinated about all this stuff I did in the Middle East and everything. And, you know, I'm just sitting there kind of dumbstruck. And finally I said, and he, I called him Mr. McCartney. He said, oh, no, he called me Paul. Okay. Linda didn't say nothing. <laughs> and I said, you know, this is, this is kind of surreal to me. He said, why? I said, well, you're one of the Beatles, for God's sake. Something I grew up with you. He said, I put my pantyhose on one leg at a time like everybody else. <laughs> well, later on, they, we was, the, there was four or five of us there, because they got a big group, so there's four or five drivers, and I was one designated for Paul and Linda. I was the only one that had a suit. That's what it was. And uh, the, they had some T-shirts that they were going to be handing out to the crowd. And uh, one of the guys said, could we have one of those T-shirts? Well, their security guy, he was a real pill. Hey, he started berating us and yelling at us and carrying on how, you know, we were worthless scum. We, were, we didn't deserve anything and all that stuff. Not a nice fellow. Unbeknownst to him, Paul McCartney walked in, stood behind him while he was going on his tightrope. Paul let him go for a little bit. We could all see him, but he couldn't. Well, after a little bit, Paul just walked over and tapped him on the shoulder. This guy turned around and I've never seen white. I mean, it's whiter than that tablecloth. He said, your services will no longer be required. Please leave now. And he said, fellas, take all the T-shirts you want, and I'll sign every one of them. And he did. And then he said, Dave, you want to see my airplane? I said, yeah. He said, That's <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. So we got in the car and went out to the airport, and he took me on a tour of his jet. I still got pictures of it. Pretty nice. Pretty nice airplane. So like I said, you know, I keep, you know, I tell these stories and everybody says, well, that's just lying. No, I'm not. And so I've had this bizarre life where all this kind of weird stuff has happened to me. Now I'll tell you one, you're absolutely not going to believe it. It's, that it's about the, the period of time in Egypt. <clears throat> so you remember Muhammad. Muhammad Osman Muhammad. Everybody's got two names. I was actually on the streets of Cairo one time, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way. It's just that everybody seemed like having got the same name. And I said, hey, Muhammad. And half the guys turned around and looked at me. And I said, Akamai. Oh, and the rest of them turned around. <laughs> so, you know, I never could get it straight. But Muhammad went over there, and he was supposed to help us. We were trying to cut a grain deal with the, uh, uh, with the Minister of Interior in Cairo. And grain uh, in the Middle East is big business. To make a lot of money. That's before I lost everything. Uh, and he called me up, which was not easy, because when, uh, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So he, he called me up and he says, Can you find for me three jets? I said, what? what? What did you say? Three jets. Jets? What kind of jets? Uh, the 747 kind. Holy cow, you want the biggest jets in the world? What do you want them for? I have them sold. What? <laughs> 
I don't know anything about finding jets or anything else. And he says, no, no, you must do this. I have the deal. I have the deal. And he hung up. So I went, I went back to my little house. And I'm sitting there that night watching CNN, which I don't watch anymore. But I was watching it then, and they had a story about the jets out in the Mojave Desert. And there was three white 747s sitting there with no markings on them. Hmm. I, you know, I called up Great Dane. I might as well try this. So I called CNN. Finally got through to somebody who said, oh, yeah, that story, that was about those jets that had been decommissioned by Air Canada. Oh, really? They want to sell them? I don't know, I guess. So I called Air Canada. Do you know how hard it is to call somebody on the phone and tell them you want to buy their jets? <laughs> took me three days to get somebody to finally say, well, all right. <laughs> and they put me through to somebody that actually could... Give me some information. I said, how much you want for them jets? One $115 million a piece for them. That's a lot of money. But apparently 747s ain't that much. So I said, okay, I need the specs. Do you know how many pages? <laughs> and do you remember what fax machines used to be like? In 1986? Well, it took about a day and a half to get... The specs, because buyer in Egypt wanted the specs. If you try, it used to. Now, the younger folks here have no idea about this, because now you just put a piece of paper in there and it's done. If you do it at all, but then you had this little curly paper that you had to, and when you and you didn't just click a button, you had to call up and say, "Hello, you got a fax? Turn it on. I'm gonna put this phone in the coupler here, and I'm gonna try to send you a fax." And maybe it'd work, and maybe it wouldn't. Technology wasn't what it is today. Well, imagine calling Egypt. It goes like this. Hello. 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 Uh, I have a fax. Fax? Yes, I have a fax. Turn on your fax machine. We have fax. I know you got a fax. Turn it on. Hello? Now, fax. I want to send a fax. Hello? I want to send you a fax. We have fax. Goodbye. <laughs> So it took me about a week to get all the stuff over. No, no, forget FedEx. FedEx, are you kidding? You know what that cost then? Shoot. Might as well rent a plane myself. Yeah. Anyway, so we got all that done, and he calls me up and says, They're sold. I have the deal. I'm coming home. Click. Takes him two days to get home. I pick him up at the airport. I said, now, what in the world is going on here? You're about to work me to death on this. Oh, I just, we make $5 million a piece. Wow, that's great. Who are you selling the jets to? You know Qaddafi? Wait a minute, Muammar Qaddafi of Libya? The guy they just shot in the head? Yes. Well, we can't do any business with him. He's on the blacklist. What is this blacklist? That means we can do no business with him or we'll go to jail. Uh, for how long? I don't care how long. I'm not going to jail. <laughs> But $5 million. I said, I don't care. I'm not going to jail. You must find out. You must find out. So I actually called up and talked to the guy in Washington who was on the country desk for Middle East. It took a while to get to him. But I finally got to him, and I told him the circumstances. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you here. I, I, you know, I, I have no ulterior motives, but I got contacted with this. I told him the whole story. And he was a comedian. He said, uh, yeah, go ahead and sell him the jets. Really? Oh, that's great. And he said, yeah, we'll hunt you down like a dog, and we'll put you in prison for the next 42 years. And we'll take your money. That's not a good thing. Now, how about if I sold them by somebody else in another country, because I had 32 agents around the world. Yeah, we'll get you. I don't think so. And that, that actually happened. That's not. I'm, I'm not lying about that. That actually happened. So, what did I do? I, obviously, I didn't drive limousines the rest of my life. I met a lot of people, Hulk Hogan and uh, the Temptations and the Tops and all kind of great people, wonderful people. Some of them are great, some of them, you know, uh, but a lot of them are nice people. So what did I do then? I can't remember my next slide. Okay. It was called the Dove, by the way. Uh, so one day while I'm driving a van, uh, Picking up Microsoft employees and taking them from the building to their car. That's pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> but it was, it was over there. Microsoft used to be at the Belt Center. 
they're now down this big nice place one markers off the roof uh, but they were the belts under there and they had some offices kind of in the back and so there was a little distance from the building to where they could park so that's why they hired a van so I'm driving these guys I'm doing I'm making like three bucks an hour and you know I'm, I'm scrambling for nickels literally and uh, trying to keep them starving to death so I asked one of them how do I get a job here he said uh, you technical of course I'm gonna say whatever I have to I wasn't that technical I was okay but I wasn't technical and he said I'll tell you what if you're here tomorrow I'll bring you a fax number you better dang well know I was there tomorrow and he got on and he gave me the fax number so I managed to get me a resume together and get it faxed and for three weeks I didn't hear nothing and then I got a phone call I actually had a phone I had a phone call it wasn't a cell phone uh, I got a phone call I said uh, I want you to come in for an interview <laughs> yes sir and now no more okay. so I managed to get over there on time and uh, I didn't wear a tie. I knew better than that because when the fellows came out of the car, none of them had ties on. So I knew better than wear a tie. So I remember I was desperate for a job. I mean desperate. So I gave an interview, and, you know, I did my best. I didn't think I got it. But then they called me up and said, we want you to do a second interview. Microsoft wears you out. So when you go to work for Microsoft, you have to do like three, four, five interviews and talk to everybody. So I went through all the interviews and I made it. And then they said, okay, we've got 20 people going to go through a one-month training program. We're going to hire two of them. Well, short of killing the rest of them, I was going to get that job. <laughs> I remember there's one guy we had from Belgium. How many people are Dutch? Good. Oh, well, you, you're excused. <laughs> no, I, I love the Dutch people. But, even, but they are known, like Americans, to be stubborn. So he came in with a coat and tie. Well, the manager that was teaching us was wearing a T-shirt and shorts and flip-flops. And the first day, he looked around and he saw the Belgian. He said, uh, Microsoft does not like people wearing ties. Please do not wear a tie. And then he went on to his session. You know, and we did our thing. Two days later, the Belgian still had on the tie. The guy once again said, Microsoft does not buy ties. Please do not wear a tie. Two days later, the Belgian still had on the tie. The manager walked up to him with the scissors and cut it off and said, you can leave now. Now we're down to 19. <laughs> so we went on and pure luck, I was one of the two they hired. I was making ten dollars an hour, <sighs> but I'd lost my place to live, so I had to live at Microsoft. And I figured out I could do that because they had this place called the Hard Drive Cafe, <laughs> and they would supplement your food, so you could eat fifty cents, you could eat well, or a dollar. And they also had showers, and that's back when they had foosball games and stuff. And that's also back when Bill Gates used to come down to visit. So they had, and you had a cubicle there, and you had plenty of room, so I didn't have many clothes anyway. So I just took what I had and stuffed it in a bag, and you weren't, you know, sweatshirt and sweatpants every day, and nobody cares. So I lived there about four months until my supervisor figured out one day, this man's living here. <laughs> he kind of hung around late one night waiting for me to go, and he says, what time are you going home? I said, well, I'm working on something. He'd come around after another hour, and finally he sat down, and he said, You've been living here. I said, yeah, I've got no other place to live. He said, tomorrow we're going to find you a place to live. I figured he'd fire me, but he didn't. It turned out to be one of the best friends I ever had. So I kept working there, moving up a little bit. I became a mentor, a mentor at Microsoft at that time. I don't know what to do now. But that's the person that's the escalation person. I used to be really technical. That's, that's why I got three of these before I became stupid. Uh, so my first three MVPs were because I was technical. And every once in a while you might ask me a question and kind of be surprised. I know the answer. Uh, but I was the one that not only took the really heavy questions that nobody could solve, but also I was the one that 
did the teaching of how to handle this, how to handle that, how to do this, how, to, and how this works. And so I was doing goal support for Windows NT 3.0. <laughs> yeah, some of you guys as old as I am, so you're going, oh my God, yeah. It was a dull. It was a dull. And so it was tough. So when you get a big company in New York that's screaming bloody murder because all their servers just went down because of this silly operating system, and you take three hours to get them back online and straightened out by phone, you're kind of beat up. <clears throat> and that was, I'll tell you, that was the lowest point in my life. I'd had this big major company. I was all over the world. I was walking on air. I had anything I wanted, made plenty of money, and then I lost everything, wiped out. So I'm kind of low down. I'm just, I'm just hunkered down. I'm just gritting my teeth and just living one day at a time. That's all I'm doing. And, you know, at this point, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Just grit your teeth and work. That's all I'm doing. Just everything I'm making is going for my kids. You know, I'm still barely scraping by. I actually lost about 40 pounds during that time. Not because of pride, just because I didn't have enough to eat. So, you know, really struggle. So I'm feeling pretty low. And I get off this three-hour call, I'm exhausted. Pull my headphones down. They're like this big. I look like Princess Leia. And I put them around my neck and turn around, and Bill Gates is standing there and says, Hi, I'm Bill. I'm not really ready for this. <laughs> Hello. And, you know, I'm just kind of struck. You know, he's, I heard he was coming down, but he's never going to come talk to peons like me. So he... He's visiting around, but he stops and talks to me for about 10 minutes. You know, he says, I really appreciate what you do for my show. You know, you're the backbone. You guys, what you do, you're the backbone of what we do. You make us who we are. And he said, what do you think we can do better? I'm sitting there. The smartest man in the world just asked me for my opinion. Holy cow. So after a few minutes of that, you know, he left, and I'm just kind of sitting there, and my head's ringing. You know, he was so cordial. He was so personal. And I'm thinking, if he has that much confidence in me, there's dang near nothing I can't do. So you know what? I'm going to do it. So it built a fire under me because I was dead. I, just, I was just moving around, but I was dead. But he, he fired me back up. Now, I'm not a big Bill Gates lover, but he really inspired me in that moment. And, it could, you know, a lot of people could have done it, but it was him. And so I, I buckled down. And I went from there to being uh, an application developer over at First Union. Goldview and Wells Fargo. What's it this week? I don't know. But I was a developer. And I wrote an application over there that... For four years after I left, they were begging me to come back and work on it because it was so important to them. I felt real good about doing that. And then they made me a project manager over all their application development and then became an NT administrator. I was the first one that brought Windows NT into First Union because they were using Novell. And I brought, no, I brought NT in because Novell kept crashing on me and I couldn't get anything done. So I'm sitting there. I've got 11 applications running simultaneously, watching my code and writing my code. And the CIO comes by and he says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm fixing your application. And he said, no, what are you running? That's not what I've authorized. I said, look, you fire me if you want to. I supported this product at Microsoft. I know what it can do. And if you want me to get this done, whether I have to reboot this blasted machine 15 times an hour, you need to let me run this because it will do it. And he stood there and he watched it for a while. No crashes, no reboots, nothing. He went out the next day and bought 150 servers of NT on it, and they never went back. Now, maybe I had something to do with that or not. I don't know, but we got the job done. So, did that, went over to Sealand, worked over there. That's where this group started. And that's, now that's another part of my presentation, is to let people know how this group got started, leading up to that. So I'm sitting over Sealand. I'm still kind of scrambling. I'm not making nothing like the money I used to make. But I'm, I'm working hard, and I'm, I'm trying to do a good job. And I get this email from Microsoft. Congratulations. You've been selected as MVP. I don't know what that is. <laughs> is it pay money? 
what is it? So they call me up and they tell me this great honor they've bestowed on me. I said, for what? Well, you know, you've been identified as one of the top peer people. You know, you work for Microsoft. You did this. You did that. So they knew all. They knew all this stuff about me. Where did you get this? They're like the FBI. They're going out and investigating you. Know? And okay, so what needs to happen with that? So, well, we'd like for you to come to Redmond. Redmond? Where's that? Oh, it's in Seattle. Oh, okay. You going to pay for it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I get to fly to Seattle. So I got the CIO at, at Sealand to let me take some time off. And I went out there, and I was out there with a bunch of user group leaders. I didn't know what a user group was, but there was a bunch of them. And there was three or four guys that said they were MVPs. So I'm talking to them, what is this MVP thing? And they all said the same thing, you know. <laughs> so we're all sitting around, and this guy, this VP at Microsoft, and I, I, I heard later on that that's like being the Pope or something. So they came in the room and said, we are developing a new program that's going to be worldwide, and it's going to change the face of the IT world. And we want this group in this room to drive that. That's Microsoft speak that they're going to work in the next 10 hours without stopping. And they called it TechNet. And so they called us the TechNet Roundtable. There was 25 of us. And they said, we want you to help us develop this. We want to know what's important for the IT pro and the developer. And we want to build something that's going to be lasting. So that's how TechNet got started. Well, in the process of talking with some of these Microsoft guys. That VP came over to me and he said, Dave, you're from Charlotte. I said, is that anything you don't know? No, I'm a VP. Okay. So, he said, we've tried to start a user group down there three times and we've never had any luck with it. But I believe Charlotte is a great place for a user group. Would you be willing to start one? Said, what do I have to do? Sign people up, find a place to meet, and we'll, we will provide you speakers. Okay. Any money? I hear that a lot. <laughs> so I came down here, and they gave me a nice little shirt, a little yellow shirt that says Tech. And we had some kind of a tech event. I don't even remember. What, yeah, it was the first, first TechNet event in Charlotte held here in Charlotte and there's one of them hotels downtown and I stood outside the door with my little clipboard and I'm going to give you a break two minutes stood outside the door with my little clipboard and I said you want to join a user group nine out of ten people said what's that I said well I don't really know but if you'll sign up here and give me an email we'll figure it out <laughs> so 72 people signed up amazing I'll take you a break, and then I'll tell you the rest of it. There's a lot more to tell, and I'll squeeze it in, I promise. Our first meeting, we had 52 people show up. 52 at our first meeting. And our first presenter was one of the guys that was the president of the Raleigh IT, or NT user group at that time. The Raleigh user group came and presented at my my first meeting and he just written a book on security he was really smart he did a great job so it was a great meeting the next meeting went over a hundred and every meeting after that for six years went over a hundred so the maximum number of people you could put in that room at Sealand they were nice enough to let me use it was 65 people hmm. this doesn't work we had them out in the hallway. We had them there. But during that time, I have a little success story I've told from time to time because I've had a lot of people say, what do you have to do to be a member? Do you have to be an IT pro, developer, project manager? Do you have to be certified? Do you have to do blah, blah, blah? The answer to all that is no. No. And I've always said that because my whole premise for this thing was, number one, it should be open to everybody who wants to learn. Everybody who wants to advance, everybody who wants to network, everybody who wants to be part of a family 
of IT professionals, no matter what your discipline, it should be open to you. And I got a lot of pressure early on to charge dues. How are we going to get money? And I said, we'll get money. You know, the money will come, and it always has. It always has. But I'm not going to beat my members up for money. You know, the members are here to learn and get benefit. They're not here to, you know, put money in the coffers. I don't believe in passing a hat and all that stuff. Besides, if I, if I put membership out, I have to be a collection agency and go after you guys when you don't pay your dues. I don't want to do that. So I had a woman come into one of my meetings, and she kind of stood over to the side, and we had a good presentation. And, and I saw her standing over there. She's kind of like she's out of place, you know, shuffling around. And, and I walked over, and I said, thanks for coming to the meeting. I'm glad to see you. Who are you? She told me her name, and I said, well, we're really pleased that you came. Thank you for uh, joining the group. She said, well, I haven't joined the group because I don't feel like I'm qualified. I said, qualified? What do you mean? She said, well, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I said, good Lord, you got more qualifications than I've got. She said, really? I said, yes. What do you, why are you here? She said, I've always wanted to learn about computers. I've always wanted to learn. And you're not far from my house, and I just heard about it. And I said, well, you're, you are why we are here. I absolutely want you to be here. I want you to learn. I want you to ask questions. Ask me questions. I'll teach you what I can. Anything. But you are why we're in, we're in business here. And at that time, we had a training company that was giving away MCSE training. Now, you guys who are at MCSEs know it's, it's expensive. You've got to go through all the exams, and it's not gotten cheaper. It's gotten more expensive over, over time. And it's tough. It's hard. Well, they gave away an MC, a complete MCSE training package, including paying for all the materials, all the training for a facility, and the exams. That was a big chunk. And she won it. And after the meeting, she's deer in the headlights. She came up to me and said, what am I going to do with this? I said, you're going to participate in it. You're going to find a way to participate in this, learn, and become certified. Her husband ran a pawn shop. He worked at a pawn shop. And so she managed to get to the sessions. They had them in the evenings. They had them at different times. She did it. She went through. She failed the exam twice, but third time she got it. She got her certification. She was an MCSE. It took her about a year and a half. But she was an MCSE. And she had her MCSE. She came to me proudly with her little diploma sheet, and she said, what am I going to do with this? And I said, you're going to put it to work. How am I going to do that? Well, I just happened to be, and you remember, when we were doing the thing at IRS, we had a contract over at IRS, and I put it to work part-time, handling my service. That was before you got there. And he used to work for me. And she got pretty good at it. And one day she came and she said, in tears, she said, I have to leave. I said, what do you mean? My husband just got transferred to Texas. Well, you're an MCSE. You get a job anywhere you want. I can? I said, yeah, I know a couple of people down in Dallas. I'll give them a call. And she went to work down there as an administrator. And as far as I know, she's down there today. See, that's what this group is all about. It's not about just coming in and eating and hanging around. That's part of it. It's not just about the presentations. It's not just about all that. It's about how you guys interface with each other, how this group serves you and the community. That was the second part of it. I've got to have this thing that does something for the community. That's why we do the thing out here. That's why we give away the money to kids first. That's why we give away the coats. That's why we do all that. You know, if you're not being part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So we want to be part of the solution a lot. And all the other nice things come from that. That's why we've never been out of money. We've never been in the, in the red. We may not be far in the black, but we've never been in the red. Is because the community knows that we're sincere about what we are want to do for everybody else. And they respond to that. And they want to be part of it. And so we've never had a problem. So I wanted to start this thing. I called it clipboard diplomacy. You know, I'd go to all the user group meetings. No, excuse me, there weren't any. I'd go all, we were the first user group of any substance, you know, well, I want to say that because there was a, there was a 
the personal computer club here that I recall. I don't think we were the first back office enterprise type group in Charlotte. And I purposely wanted to call it an enterprise kind of group. The, you know, Windows NT user group is what we did for a while. And I never was comfortable with that because that aligns you with one technology, one product type thing. So I'm sorry, I got back in the light. So we, uh, we decided quite some time ago now to change it to the IT Pro, Carolina IT Pro group. Because IT pros, to me, encompass everybody in, in the whole realm. So that's why we have it that way. Now, over the years, we have consistently had the same message. We've never changed it. Give yourself away. Make a difference. And that's what we've tried to do in everything we've ever done, every event we've ever had, every meeting we've ever had. We've always tried to do that. When we built, where's Tanessa over here? Tanessa got us building homes for the, the homeless. And we actually, a big bunch of us went out there and we worked on it. Hit my thumb with a hammer. It took me about three months to get better. But we worked hard on that stuff. And we've given to the homeless. And we've, you know, we've given to the shelters. And we've worked with kids first. And we've done all that stuff. And to me, that's important. That's what it's all about. And I think that's why we consistently have over 3,000 members in this group. Because all of our presentations are up there for anybody to look at. And they believe in what we're trying to do. And we don't take money from the government. We don't, you know, we don't ask money from you. It just comes. It just comes. And today, 3,750 plus members, 37 states, six countries outside the United States. And I've told this before, but I'll tell it again since I'm doing the presentation. I was in Moscow a few years ago doing a presentation for Microsoft. And there was a user group being meeting there at Microsoft that night. And there was about 40, 45 people there. And you know, snow doesn't bother them. It was snowing to beat the band and they all showed up. But it snows there all the time, so I guess they don't matter. So I'm giving the presentation and you know, I get to the end and uh, I said, are there any questions? And I fell in the back and waving his arm around. I said, yes, sir. He said, I am a member. I said, that's a good. What do you remember of? Of your group. Huh. What? CITPG. I am a member. Good. Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> so he just couldn't do enough. He said, didn't think he'd ever see me, but there I was. He said, you come see me. Yeah, I came to see you. He's a big fella. So today, you know, we had almost 300 at the last meeting. We got 122 signed up for this one. You know, we got money in the bank. We're giving $1,000 to kids first. We got clothes out there. We got food out there that we're giving away. We feed you. You know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it, but I'm not satisfied. All right, it quit. You can have me advance one. We've been deciding whether this Bluetooth reach all the way back there, and it did up to now. Next slide. Oh, it was turned on. I haven't turned it off. I see. No. Lights on. He's asleep. He and Galen get back there and tell lies and everything. No, I can't go over there. I, got I ain't starting over. <laughs> well, lights on up here. <laughs> okay. So I will, I will finish up a couple little things here, and then I'll take questions. This is probably the only time you'll ever get a chance to ask me questions like this. Uh, okay, let's see. If, now, see, can you advance one more back there? Technology is great when it works. Hey, I did kind of want to show you some of the awards. 
you know, we've, we've gotten a slew of awards, and it's because of what I just told you about, what our premise and our dedication and our focus has always been. So you know, we've been named national best user group in the country several times, including this past year when we got CompTIA's best user group in the U.S. So we won that award, and that came, that was 5000 bucks. That helped a lot. So we gave most of that away. The rest of it we filled in on the food that we didn't have. Uh, so this one, this is the Outstanding Community Service Award. Next one. Yeah, you're going to have to work now because it's not working at all. Hit, hit the book. So the, there was this thing called uh, the Blue Diamond Award. And again, I, I, I thank Tanessa. She's the one that really caused that to happen because Tanessa has a even deeper desire to help children than I do, which is saying something. And so we got involved in Tech Connect, which was a, a program for the schools to hook up kids in high school. Oh, this was a, that, <laughs> that was our meeting last month. That was now look at that. That's today. That's a user group. That's a user group. I sent that to Microsoft and Redmond. I said, hey, guys, here we are. And they came back and said, can we talk to you tomorrow? What do you want to talk about? We'd like to feature you on the Microsoft website. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good thing. So I'm going to talk to them more about that. Again, because you guys made the effort to get out here. Now, the fact we had a big screen TV and stuff had nothing to do with it, I know. <laughs> Next one. Now, let me talk a little bit about Comanus. Uh, there's some of you know what Comanus was, and some of you work with Comanus. Uh, some of you don't hear about Comanus, but I want to tell you about Comanus, because Comanus was based on this group, and it's appropriate to talk about it in this presentation. So about six, seven years ago, uh, Microsoft asked me and a number of other leaders of some big organizations to come to Redmond and talk to them about why IT pros don't like Microsoft. And they didn't. And we got up there and we told them pretty quickly, it's because you are a developer company. And if you go out to your site and you look at all the resources for developers, you see a lot. Resources for IT pros, hmm, not so many. And if you look at the events that you have out there and the way you structure them and the courses and the things you have, you've got a lot for developers, IT pros, and not so much. Well, how can we change that? Well, we agonized up there for about five days. Actually, it was really kind of challenging because they put us in a place that had a winery on one side and a... a, a a brewery on the other. So after nine of the guys had kind of wasted, the, the final six of us put this thing together. And we decided that the only way for this to work was an independent organization. And Microsoft's had on for a long time. They didn't have anything for IT Pro. You need to have an independent organization that's supported by, i.e. funded by Microsoft, but not controlled by them. And influence being minimal. And so, you know, I think it was a good idea. Something to identify the needs of user groups and IT pros, communicate that to Microsoft, and then fulfill those needs out in the IT community, an independent organization. And I was, I had a job. I was not interested in being involved in this stuff. So I helped them out, and I was done. You know, we got on conference calls, and then... Anybody ever been on a conference call with Microsoft? I won't say anything else. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was kind of tedious. And, you know, I, I listened to everybody kind of moan and carry on for about three weeks. And then one day, I just kind of leveled at them. You know, everybody's running around trying to see what they can do for themselves. And they're not worried about what they can do for the people they're trying to represent. I said, I'm tired of this. I'm going to tell you my opinion of it. And I kind of blasted everybody on the phone, and I said, 
I reckon that'll be the last time you'll have me on this call. I wish you all the best. Goodbye. I hung up. And that night, I had my user group note. The next week, I had my user group meeting. And I was introducing the speaker, and I looked through the door, and the VP from Redmond walked through the door. Hmm. I walked over, and I welcomed him. I said, glad to see you. What are you doing here? He said, I came down here to see you. What do you want to see me about? I ain't done nothing. He said, no, no. He said, can we have coffee after the meeting? I said, yes, you're paying for it. Yeah, I'll pay for it. All right. So we went out We went out to have coffee. He said, uh, some people at Microsoft like what you said. I said, well, there wasn't nobody much on that call. He said, that's where you're wrong. There were some, there were some big people on that call. You didn't hear them. He said, they want you to run this organization. I said, I got a job. He said, no, we're going to pay you. How much are you going to pay me? He told me. It was about $15,000 less than I was making. And they weren't going to pay any more. So I, you're asking me to take over this thing that has no foundation, no structure, you know, just an idea for less money than I'm working for. Yeah. Okay. Here's the conditions. I have to have five years of funding and writing because Microsoft's got the attention span of a two-year-old. <laughs> and number two, you have to let, it, let me run it my way and stay out of my hair. He said, the first one I can get you tomorrow. He said, the second one I've got to talk to Steve about. What I told Microsoft was they had to give up control. They didn't like that. <laughs> Not at all. So they came back and said, okay, as long as you will submit to us, you know, monthly expenditures of what you're using our money for and allow us to come visit you whenever we want to. I said, only when you let me know you're coming. <laughs> so over time, I got all those, all those things, and we started it. And there I was. I, I actually rented me an office, and I was sitting there. I could have somebody to help me out here. Because Microsoft wanted me to buy pizza coupons, and I said, that's a silly way to spend your money. So I called up Frank. And Frank went to work for me. And uh, a number of other really wonderful people went to work for me, including my son, my stepson, my stepdaughter. Over time, good exposure for them, but none of them wanted, none of them, everybody hated working for me, so they went on. But we, we built this thing out to 3 million people in 92 countries, with 26 people managing it over five years. And then Microsoft said, oops, five years. <laughs> They're true to the word. But here's the main thing. All that's fine and dandy, and a lot of, you know, we had thousands of user groups that, you know, we hosted websites and we did all this stuff. But here's the thing that is lasting that nobody talks about that I'm most proud of. Because we were able to inspire user groups like this all over the world to do what we do here. And almost a million children during that five years were positively impacted around the world. And that's what culminus was. And the reason it's like that is culminus means top of the mountain. So, still broke. Next one. Okay. This is just kind of showing we were the first user group that joined culminus, which is appropriate, I think. Next one. We were written up in Windows IT Pro magazine. Um, you know, culminus became a household word for a long time. It was known to everybody. And every time I go to the, the MVP summit, they, Microsoft pulls together all the MVPs, or as many as they can, once a year. And we go up to Redmond, and we all sit around, we get trained, and we talk to each other, and we kind of we get reacquainted. So it's kind of cool. But every time I've gone, there's always been somebody from some country that comes up and says, I love Comus. I love it. It was wonderful. Uh, next one. Uh, this one got 
probably the reason that Comer's got shut down. They really got pissed off that I was. <laughs> Next one. Now this one, this was really now this. I, I wanted to save this one toward the end because this is the circle story I call. It. So you remember what I told you about Bill Gates and how it really inspired me to get up off my butt and really do something right. And since then, I built this group, I built Comerless, and I've been an MVP nine times from that conversation. So you kind of want to say, thanks, Bill. <laughs> but you don't say, thanks, Bill. I mean, you just he's just not a guy you get close to. Until one day, a couple of years ago, about four years ago now, time flies. I got an email that says, Mr. Gates has identified you as one of the 15 most influential IT leaders in the world, and he would like to have lunch with you and your peers in Florida at Tech Ed. Can you come? Yeah. Wait a minute. You want to feed me? Yeah. So I went down there with the rest of these guys. Now, if, if you actually start looking at these fellas, Everybody up here except this fourth from the left is real important. I mean, they, you know, these are authors and leaders of massive organizations, and I mean, just amazing. But uh, I'm, I'm side of Bill because we're about the same height. <laughs> That's the only thing with that. Uh, but I sat down. Uh, his his aide was next to me, and then there was Bill. And they gave us a, a chicken leg and some potatoes and carrots and stuff. And Bill's sitting there, and we're getting ready to eat. And Bill just kind of pushes his plate away, and I look at that, and I'm thinking, the smartest man in the world ain't going to eat this, and I ain't going to eat it either. So I push it away. So we asked him questions and talked to him for about 45 minutes, and, you know, he was the same man I remember. His, I said, Bill, what are you going to do in your retirement? And that, that must have been a cue question for him, because he went the next 30 minutes to tell me about his desire and passion for helping children in education and what, how, how super important it is to, to really shape those minds in the right way, in a positive way, to get them the right nutrition, the right facilities, the right educational systems and teachers, and how important that was. And he was dedicating his life and his fortune to that. And so it was really cool to listen to him talk. But at the end, we got ready to leave, and I'm walking out behind him, and I touch him on the shoulder, and I said, Bill, can I tell you something? He said, sure, Dave, what is it? And I told him the story. And I said, all these years I wanted to thank you because you built a fire under me that put me here. And he stopped and looked at me, put his arms around me. His age was like this. And he said, Dave, you just made my year. For me to know that something I said back then has resulted in this, inspired you, made my year. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Next slide. And I just want to plug my book. <laughs> huh? Yeah, so go out and buy my book. Because I get some money to the group, and nobody's buying the book, so I ain't giving no money to the group. So if you buy my book, so it's up on, it's up on Amazon. Next slide. Now, let's talk about what's important in life, guys. Life slides by real fast. You don't look around once in a while, you might miss it. That's what Keith Larson says, and I think it's important. What you leave is your lasting legacy. The influence you have by what you do. Not necessarily what you say. So important. That's my daughter, my grandson Jonas, my son. These are what's important. The rest of us, window dressing. Those people around you, close to you, you're a hero to somebody. Every single one of you. You may not know it. Somebody's looking up to you somewhere. Might be a child, might be another adult, might be a family member. Somebody's looking up to you. Be the hero in the dark as well as the light. Next slide. And this is my son when he was four. He's not four no more. And those are precious times. So today is the first day of the rest of your life. Don't waste it. Next slide. That's my second grandson. And my first grandson and the last one. 
It's not about you. It's about the journey. And what you do for others along the way. Next slide. So make a difference. Please. And I thank you for your time. We have thank you. We have a few minutes for questions if you'd like to ask one. Yes, sir. You might speak up. I got hearing aids, but they don't do that great. Oh. What about Gates? Did you meet Belinda Gates? Oh, Belinda? No, oh Lord no. Uh uh-uh. uh. Bill don't really travel with her. She was a uh, she was one of the techie guys up at uh, Redmond, I think, when he met her. She's just a down to earth person. I've heard. I've never met her. But knowing Bill, I don't know him that well, but I have met him twice. Uh, you know, he's a he's a pretty down to earth guy. I can't see him being with somebody that's not. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I believe I do up in the attic somewhere. <laughs> I auction it off. Huh? I have two grandchildren. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm counting on my son. And, you know, <laughs> we'll see. Any other questions? Yes, sir. No, and I'll tell you a story about that. The best MVP shirt I believe they ever had. It was a, uh, it was kind of like a blue jeans kind of a shirt, a Cambry kind of shirt. Super comfortable, really nice cut feel. Loved it, absolutely loved it. And I was in Copenhagen at an event, and uh, you know these events. When I go to them, you know we start in the morning. Frank can tell you he's been there with me. You start in the morning, you go up to midnight, and you're, the time you get back to the room, you are exhausted. So I got in the room, closed my door, heard the lock click, took my clothes off and just collapsed in the bed and fell asleep. I was dead. Woke up the next morning, my pants, my backpack, and my shirt, and everything was gone. So that was my first MVP shirt. It wasn't my first MVP, but I liked that shirt. I wore it a lot. So no, I don't have it. Sadly, now that was in that was in the Netherlands, and I discovered that just about everybody in the Netherlands, all the men over there, and a lot of the women are seven foot tall. So when I went to the police, I said, you know, they took everything, including my pants and shirt. And so you got any idea of what they might, the person might look like? Well, of course not. But I said, just find somebody with sleeves up to here and up to here. And <laughs> any other questions? Yes, sir. That one, then this one, in the back. Uh, did I do a lot in Eastern Bloc country? What was your motivation to go to those? Oh, that was that. Well, I, actually, there's two times I went to the Eastern Bloc countries. When I had Ladub, uh, I had uh, I made friends with a furniture maker here called Black Welder. He's up in Lenore. I don't know if he's still in business. Probably not. But he made pretty decent furniture. And I hooked up with him at lunch one day with somebody else, and I was telling about all what I was doing. He said, "You want to sell my furniture?" I said, "What?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "I'll put your name on." We'll sell it anywhere. I'll ship it where you want. Okay, let me get back to you. So I got set up with this fellow. I got set up with another fellow that had contacts in Russia uh, and the Baltic states. And pretty soon I'm shipping couches to Moscow. And I had to ship three container loads to get one container in my showroom because they stole them all on the duck. Uh, now, that was Ladub. And I was also uh, distributed computers. Uh, there used to be a, a computer company called Midwest Micro. And they would build a computer with your logo on it. And it was pretty cheap. So I got set up with IBM out of Raleigh to sell uh, all of their refurbished PCs they used to do. And so I would sell 10,000 computers at a time into Egypt to be distributed out to the Middle Eastern countries. And then another 10,000 would go over to Poland to be distributed out that way for IBM. So I became the primary distributor for IBM in the Middle East for a while. Didn't make no money, though. Uh, and so with, with communists, uh, we had members all over. I mean, uh, I remember going to Prague in January one time, 
Uh, it was 38 below zero. And it was an MVP summit over there. And I went over there, and uh, I was on the bus. You know, they always pile us on the bus. I was on the bus, and this, this guy from Tunisia next to me, it's 38 below zero, and he has on a suit jacket. I said, man, you're going to freeze. He said, they lost my luggage. This is all I got. Well, you know, I'm faced with something. I'm sitting there with a big parka that Microsoft gave me. And it's got, it's got this feather lining and everything, and I'm just warm as toast. And this guy's sitting there chattering. Okay, so I unzip the lining. I say, here, wear this until you get your clothes back. I found out pretty quick that the shell of that coat doesn't keep you very well. <laughs> And it was four days before they got him a coat. So I remember walking along, and Microsoft says, Today we're going to take a walking tour. So I'm walking around there like this, and this big Russian MVP next to me. I mean, he's, I'm like this. And he's looked down, and he said, Little man, you are cold. I said, you're dang right I'm cold. I'm about to freeze to death. And he took his hat off, and it just covered my whole head. He said, Now are you warm. <laughs> I still got the hat. Well, I gave it to my dad. It covers his head, too. <laughs> All right, now your question. Well, there was uh, uh, several things happened at once. You had the five-year contract, if you will, is expired. I think if the economy had been in better shape, we'd had a better opportunity. But because at that, just at that point, Microsoft was shifting their focus economically, and Frank can comment on this, uh, they wanted to go to more of an, a volunteer organization. And they'd always kind of pushed for that, uh, like I it has been always volunteer, and give a little bit of funding, but, you know, not so much. They were supporting a company. And we, we approached it from the standpoint of being a company. We ran it that way. And it was very efficient. It got everything done. Volunteers are great. We've got a lot of volunteers, and I love them. But, hey, if I'm a volunteer, let's see. I've got job, family, house, dog, car, volunteer. You know, your priorities just can't be there. But if your job is doing this, you get a lot more things done. GITCA is the, uh, is, I don't even know what it stands for. I give it to the Canadians as fast as possible, I think. Anyway, GITCA was the replacement for Colmanus, and it's an all-volunteer organization, and it's still in place as far as I know. Frank was on the board for a couple of years. Yeah, Frank just resigned recently. So, another question? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, Microsoft has stopped funding it completely now, right? Yeah. After he spoke to me, I won't say that I had this revelation, but I, I knew, and you know, I've always, I've always been, uh, half of me is Irish and the other half is Cherokee Indian. <laughs> what a combination, huh? They say God invented liquor to take, keep the Irish from taking over the world, uh, but I, I don't, I don't really drink. Uh, so I didn't have a revelation. I've always kind of managed by saying, uh, Lord, point me in the direction you want me to go. And that's what I did. And that's what I still do. And I've never gone wrong that way. So it just kind of unfolded on its own. And still is. Yeah, I'm always excited about what tomorrow's going to be. Be optimistic. So how do, you, how do you plan out your life? How do you reach those goals you want to reach? How do you do that? Okay, arguably I've reached every goal that I could ever have wanted to achieve in my life. I've done so much. I've been everywhere. I've done everything. I've seen everything. I've been down in the in uh, the, the the bottom of the pyramid and the top of the Eiffel Tower and everywhere in between. There's nothing that I have I haven't squeezed out of life, and I don't think I've ever really planned it. I don't think I've ever really tried to push it. But every any time an opportunity came my way. I tried to take my fear and put it behind me. And I'm not going to be afraid of succeeding. Don't let fear stop you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's the biggest thing. Like, how many of you 
would be comfortable standing up here talking to this many people for an hour. A few of you are. Some of you are not. Some people that I've heard it said that doing presentations in public in front of a great large group of people is more fearful than the thought of death itself. I can understand that. But if you let fear get in front of you, you can't see past it. The fear is behind you. There's nothing to stop you. Step forward. Be bold. Question? Yes, sir. I'll, say, I'll second that. He's one of the best presenters we ever had. And you make a good point. Uh, if there's anybody else here that has opportunities make sure that you make yourself available, that they know who you are, that, that uh, you connect together, because we want to get everybody moving in the right direction. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I can only do this presentation so many times. <laughs> and Nate has been working mightily, and thank you, Nate, for your efforts, and Frank and all the board members, we really appreciate you. Now, I want to remind you that we do need a sponsorship director, you know, somebody that will really help us to identify and bring in the sponsors and keep them engaged and provide for their needs. We really need somebody to help with that. And if you if you want to be part of the, the, the board of directors, if you want to really get involved with CITPG, just let me know. I'll find a place for you. Anybody who's been around me a long time knows I'll put you to work quick. I delegate really well. So just let us know. We'll do that. Now we want to, Frank's gone out to get the, the computer, bring it in so that we can, get, we can give away these door prices. So why don't you take a quick break, restroom break, stretch yourself, and then we'll, we'll give away the door prices.